One of the central tenets of the prosecution's case in the trial of the century is that the bloody gloves the killer wore when Nicole Brown and Ron Goldman were murdered belonged to O.J. Simpson. Despite the debacle earlier when Simpson tried and failed to put the gloves on in front of the jury, the prosecution brings it up again. I'm Roger Kosak, and this is OJ25. Simpson is again present with his counsel, Mr. Shapiro, Mr. Cochran, Mr. Douglas, Mr. Blazer, Ms. Snyder Chapman, Mr. Sheck, people represented by Ms. Lewis, Mr. Darden, Mr. Hodgman. Mr. Cochran, who's next? Uh, our final witness, Your Honor, is uh, Detective Mark Furman. We're ready to proceed. All right, how do you propose to proceed? Well, we'd like to call uh, Detective Furman to the stand, Your Honor, and ask him, um, get his lawyer down here and ask uh, a series of questions, or as many questions as the court thinks is appropriate, and then move ahead. The next logical thing, based upon the evidence we presented over the last two days, is that, and they know Mark Furman was never excused because in their presence you said that he was on 72 hours call. All right, Detective uh, Furman, I'm going to uh, release you from further testimony today. However, you are still subject to recall. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that would be the next logical witness. Once again, Your Honor is confronted with a unique, unprecedented uh, situation. We have filed a, a request for remedies this morning that uh, suggested three remedies for the invocation of the Fifth Amendment by Detective Furman. Uh, first, uh, to allow us to call Detective Furman in the presence of the jury, um, or alternatively, at least permit the testimony uh, presented yesterday invoking the privilege to be read to the jury. Uh, secondly, a special uh, jury instruction uh, advising the jury uh, of his unavailability for further cross-examination. Um, and finally, uh, the admission of uh, portions of the tapes and transcripts uh, regarding prior acts of planting or manufacturing evidence uh, to now be admitted as declarations against interest. Detective Furman, did you plant or manufacture any evidence in this case? I assert my Fifth Amendment privilege. The apparent reason for the invocation of the, of the Fifth Amendment privilege here uh, is this witness's concern uh, for prosecution for perjury for the testimony he presented uh, to this jury. With respect to the improper question they posed to Detective Furman yesterday, whether or not he planted evidence, knowing full well that he did not plant evidence, knowing full well that he could never say he could, he didn't plant evidence, because the minute he answered that question, there's a waiver. It's unfair. This highlights exactly why that's unfair. When you get a police officer taking the Fifth Amendment, that's pretty significant. And uh, it's important for the jury to know that they took the Fifth. We don't challenge that uh, invocation of the, of the Fifth Amendment. Uh, I think uh, under these circumstances, that is a realistic concern of the witness. Um, and uh, the, the case law seems to confirm that uh, where a witness faces jeopardy of perjury prosecution for testimony previously pre pre presented in the case, uh, that the invocation of the Fifth Amendment is, is privileged or is appropriate. You, what you do not know is why he was going to invoke, and that's why it's improper to speculate. That's why any kind of instruction that a witness has, has taken the fifth <coughs> should never be given, because no matter how many times you tell them don't speculate, that's precisely what the jury is going to do. And that's precisely what Mr. Cochran is asking the world to do. The court will instruct the jury as possible, excuse me, as follows. Detective Mark Furman is not available for further testimony as a witness in this case. 
his unavailability for further testimony both on cross-examination, excuse me, on cross-examination is a factor which you may consider in evaluating his credibility as a witness. We are preparing an emergency stay at this time. I request from the court a written ruling indicating the basis for its ruling uh, concerning the jury instruction proposed. All right, that request is denied. Case authority that supports the giving of the instruction that the court has proposed. All right, I'll prepare a, uh, have the clerk and the court reporter prepare a transcript of the uh, proceedings and the arguments today. That'll be your record. This writ is a Hail Mary for the prosecution. The last thing they want is for jurors to start drawing inferences and coming to conclusions as to why Detective Furman wasn't available for any more cross-examination. We would request until tomorrow morning before the court consider instructing the jury on this matter. Uh, We do need the time to prepare the paperwork in order to submit it to the Court of Appeals. They knew this day was coming. Everybody knew that. It's not gonna save them till tomorrow morning. What you're doing is minimally, uh, entirely appropriate. We want to move on with this case, Judge. We have a jury that's going to be mutinying uh, very shortly, as this court knows, and we need to resolve this matter. All right. Thank you, Counsel. Uh, Ms. Clark, Mr. Cochran, as uh, Dean Allman mentioned, this is a unique factual and legal situation, something that I've never seen before, never had to contemplate before. Of course, that's nothing unusual in this particular case. Um, I'll give the uh, prosecution till noon tomorrow. Let's stay on that. We can't rest until, I guess, till noon tomorrow. So that by effectively what they've done is wasted the rest of the day and half the day tomorrow. We can't really do anything, can we, based upon this? And nothing's going to come of this, Your Honor. Uh, this is a matter of your discretion. We do have uh, the whim of... This, this one prosecutor here, we have these 14 jurors back there. So what if we lose all of them? We're on track to resolve this. And they're standing over there being petulant, saying we want to wait till tomorrow. Now, may I ask that the court has been very clear that they do, it does not appreciate personal attacks. Mr. Cochran stands before this court daily and engages in that very thing at sidebar and before the court, calling the saying that the jury is being made to sit at my whim. It's not a whim when the people feel that there's been a violation of law that may seriously impact on the people's right to a fair trial. That's no whim. That's serious. And I am the advocate for the people. It is my duty to make sure that when I think a violation of law has occurred to the detriment of the people or the defendant for that matter, it is my duty to do all that I can to make sure that that is remedied. That's no whim, Your Honor. Thank you. And I'm not being petulant and insisting on enforcing those rights. We're finding out on the news what's happening. What, what do we say to our client there who's, who's asking for a fair trial? All he wants is a fair trial. I noted uh, this morning that the court had not been served with a copy of your writ. Is that an oversight? Uh, I think it's been filed. What added another layer to all of this and made things even more complicated was the bombshell from the appellate court that they actually sided with the prosecution. Probably never in a million years did the state think that the appeals court was actually going to side with them on this one. Who would think this would happen over jury instructions? So we're near the finish line. This should be so simple. And yet again, the Simpson case is anything but. Court TV's trial memos from the Simpson case include thousands of pages from veteran Court TV producers. Even they are surprised by the appellate court ruling. The Simpson case was once again tossed into the abyss, leaving the jury on ice and no one knowing what to expect next when the California 2nd District Court of Appeals ordered Judge Ito not to read jurors his proposed instruction on Mark Furman's unavailability for further testimony. Ito complied and voided his instruction, forcing the defense to now argue its case before the Court of Appeals. All right, Mr. Cochran, what's your uh, position on the defense ability to rest at this time? As the court is aware, the defense really never rests. But more specifically, in this case, we cannot rest at this point uh, for a number of reasons. We are very mindful of our jury back there, but we want to take a rip on this whole issue because uh, we're in a situation, Your Honor, where we've talked a lot about a search for truth, where this jury will basically be lied to, that they will not understand what really happened in this courtroom. 
We, you're not permitted to give a jury instruction. So far, we can't call him back. Uh, this man has lied and purged himself to the entire world. All right, what's the people's position? I believe that one of the orders issued by the Court of Appeals was that there would be no further stays. But Mr. Cochran, if he has no further witnesses to call before this jury, has to rest. That's all he has to do. And if he wants to take a writ, he may take the writ. He's always entitled to do that. That's fine. But not take any more time away from this jury. You can imagine how Mr. Simpson felt on Friday. All these things went by through fax machines and telephones, and we're finding out on the news what's happening. What, what do we say to our client there? He was, was asking for a fair trial. All he wants is a fair trial. If he has no further witnesses for this jury to hear, he's through. And the court has the power, and in fact the duty at this point, to say, it's over. It's over. If you had gone ahead, as we'd ask you to, to give that jury instruction, we wouldn't have this problem. It would have been over at this point, but they saw fit to take their writ. We have a right to do the same thing. And the court gave them a stay. And as far as the Court of Appeals, I think they misconstrued. I cannot believe that a Court of Appeals in this state would tell you that you can't grant any further stays at all in this case, no matter what happens. They might as well come down and try the case if that's the case. On the basis of the request, these are extra extraordinary issues. I don't think uh, anybody would agree that, uh, I think everybody would agree that these are unusual and unique legal issues. And if the defense wishes to pursue their writ remedies, uh, then they have every right to do so. Uh, and I am not going to require the defense at this time to rest. The defense has indicated to me that they have not finalized their decision whether to rest their case at this point in time. Uh, and I have allowed them to delay that decision uh, for a brief period of time to give them the opportunity to contemplate the legal issues and the factual issues that are involved in making that decision. And I am directing the prosecution to make use of this time by beginning the presentation of some of their rebuttal witnesses. So you should under underline that we're change, shifting focus at this point in time, but we have not concluded the defense case yet. All right, Ms. Clark, are you prepared to present uh, a new witness on your rebuttal case? Yes, I am. All right, you may call your first rebuttal witness. Thank you, Your Honor. People call Mr. Mark Kruger. I'm directing your attention, sir, to the date of December 29th, 1990. On that date, can you tell us where you were? Uh, Soldier Field in Chicago, Illinois. And why were you in Soldier Field in Chicago? I was uh, shooting photos for my uh, stepfather's newspaper. And what kind of shots were you taking? What were you there for? Uh, Chicago Bear shots. Just uh, any, anything I could get that's interesting. And was that, that was a football game? Yeah. The Bears versus who? Uh, Kansas City Chiefs. Showing you people 605, sir. Can you please tell me if you recognize the photograph I'm showing you? Yes, I do. And what is that? Uh, it's a picture of uh, O.J. Simpson at a football game, at the game I was at. And is that the photograph that you took, sir? Yes, it is. But is he wearing gloves in this picture? Yes, he is. And Mr. Simpson's indicating that his fingers are all the way into the glove and run. What uh, is either forgotten or discounted at this point in time was that very unfortunate event actually led to something of great evidentiary benefit to us, which was collecting a dozen or more photos of Simpson wearing the heiress light size extra large gloves. I was at uh, Riverfront uh, Stadium covering a uh, playoff game between the Cincinnati Bengals and the Houston Oilers. I was at uh, Candlestick Park in San Francisco. And for what purpose, sir? I was taking pictures of the San Francisco 49ers Houston Oilers game. I was photographing uh, the Los Angeles Raiders football game against the Buffalo Bills. I was at Rich Stadium in Orange Park, New York. The Buffalo Bills against the Indianapolis Colts. I was at Giant Stadium in East Rutherford, New Jersey. Do you recognize the person depicted in that photograph? Yes. Who is it? O.J. Simpson. Is that the photograph you took of the defendant on December 25th, 1993? Yes, it is. 
Can you tell us if you recognize those photographs I've just marked as 606E through J? Yes, I do. And what are those photographs of, sir? Pictures of uh, defendant. Can you tell us how far away you were from the defendant when you took these pictures? I would say approximately 10 to 14 feet. Is this a photograph you took of the defendant on January 15th, 1994 in the media room? Yes, it is. And how far away from him were you when you took this photograph, sir? Uh, about a distance of three to five feet. We were permitted to introduce that evidence in trial, but again, that seems to be something lost in the mists of time or, uh, or forgotten. You don't know how to find all of these hundred or so other glove companies around the world? If you, if you want to pay me to do that, I'll be glad to do it. Morning, ladies and gentlemen. All right, the people may call the next witness. Richard Rubin, Your Honor. All right, Richard Rubin recalled. The prosecution's glove expert, Richard Rubin, testified twice during the trial. He testified that the gloves found at the crime scene were Eris Leather Lights, style number 70263. The discovery of photos and video of Simpson wearing gloves at various football games prompts the prosecution to call Rubin back to the stand. Mr. Rubin, you testified before this jury on June 21st. That was the last time, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And had you been sent some videotape and or photographs by a member of my office? Yes, I okay. did receive some. Was that both videotapes and photographs? Yes. And what was shown in those photographs? There were various still photos and videos of a group of NFL football games where Mr. Simpson was announcing. Are there certain characteristics of the glove that help you as an expert to identify the glove when you see the glove? There are certain characteristics of the Brasser sewn style 70263, which in the design of the glove were built to make sure that it really didn't look like gloves that were less expensive. The Brasser stitching is unique to the glove. Very. How about the vent, the palm vent? Does the palm vent uh, help you to identify the glove when you see it? In conjunction with other characteristics, yes. Take a look at this uh, frame, if you will. Can you see the defendant's left hand? And yes, I can. What, if anything, uh, did you notice about the uh, hem area, the palm area? This pair of gloves appears to have a palm vent. Is that consistent with the uh, model style number 70263? Yes, it is. The first photograph of the defendant with the umbrella. Can you see the brochure stitching? Yes, I can. Can you see the needle point you described? I see the image of the needle points. Okay. Is that style number 70263? Yes, it is. You see any identifying characteristics uh, in this photograph? Three points on the left hand as well as the palm vent on the right hand. You described for us a little while ago some of the characteristics unique to style number 70263. Is that correct? Yes, I did. Do you have an opinion as to whether or not the gloves worn by the defendant in this video are Aris Leather Lights style number 70263? Based on what, I've, on what I've seen, I would say that this is style 70263, size extra large brown, knowing that I had measured the defendant's hand. Now, I'll certainly argue of that. I'm 100% certain. Now, in this particular style, Eris actually had two different kinds of brown, correct? That's correct. And one was called a brown, the other was called a mink? That's correct. Was there, were there any other terms used for those? Mink or medium brown. What colors are the evidence gloves? Brown. As opposed to medium brown? Or mink, yes. Can you tell whether the pictures that you saw, that you testified about, are brown? or mink? They're all within the brown family, but no two pictures are alike from any of the photographers. So from the brown pictures in the photographs, you can't say that they are the same shade or the same, necessarily the same color as the Evans gloves. Is that correct? To my best recollection, the color mink was so reddish 
and lighter in color that it would not be in any of the photos would they be mink. These, these photos all reflect brown gloves that I've been shown. Okay, so none of the photos that you've seen, uh, in your opinion, could be mink. That's correct. Mr. Rubin, have you tried to be completely impartial in this case? Absolutely. Uh, you haven't been currying favor with one side or the other? Absolutely not. Uh, you don't have any agenda here for one side or the other? I do not. Now, when you wrote that letter to the prosecution back on July 6th, did you include as part of that letter if you should have any questions, please feel free to contact me at any time. Please thank everyone for their hospitality during my visit. Maybe I can make it to the victory party, exclamation point, exclamation point. Correct. Now, is this party being planned before the defense started? This statement was made in jest. No differently than on the first day that I testified here, as I walked out, I wished this, Mr. Simpson and the, the crowd the best of luck. It meant nothing. You have made no effort other than contacting two glove companies to find out if there are other gloves out there that have the same characteristics as these Aris leather lights, have you? I have not contacted, I don't know, let me just say this, I do, I do not know of any other people to call other than the two largest competitors to Aris. You don't know how to find all of these hundred or so other glove companies around the world? If you, if you want to pay me to do that, I'll be glad to do it. You know where they are, don't you, Mr. Rubin? I, I, really, I really do not know where they are. I would go to Milan, I would go to Naples, and I would start to find out where all these companies are. But I'm not going to do that on my own. Were you concerned that if you looked any further, you might not be invited to the victory party? That's ridiculous. No further questions. What the judge did today was outrageous. It was vindictive. It was petty and it is uncalled for. If one thing is clear in the O.J. Simpson trial, it's that nothing is clear in the O.J. Simpson trial. And as a result, Trying to recover lost ground on the bloody gloves isn't the only thing the prosecution is trying to accomplish. Shoring up their tattered DNA evidence is another challenge on their list. Uh, first order of business counsel, I scheduled a hearing on the prosecution's motion to uh, admit certain testimony concerning the defendant's activities, I guess is what we would call it, on June the 17th. Somebody yelled out, hey, Simpson's on the, on the TV. And I look up and there's this Bronco thing. And we're thinking, how could this get any worse? How could this get out of control? Because he was supposed to turn himself in and didn't. We know this guy was running and all of a sudden the sheriffs get on the phone. They were behind him. He says, he's got a gun. And so I said, oh, now we got a big problem. This isn't no longer about wanting to talk to him about a murder. It's wanting him to get that gun and throw the damn gun out the window, get rid of it. So the day of the Bronco chase, we knew that charges were going to be filed uh, against O.J. Simpson. The evidence in the Bronco, there was a leather bag that he had, and of course he had the, the gun, I believe it was the 357 loaded. He had his passport in there, he had his Hall of Fame ring, there was about $8,000 in cash, change of underwear. He had a disguise kit with a beard and mustache that he had actually purchased about three weeks before the murders in North Hollywood. That hearing was set for 8.30 this morning. Court was here, defense counsel were here, defendant was here, and we were ready to proceed. The prosecution did not choose to uh, appear in court until uh, 9 o'clock. Is there an explanation for this? Yes, Your Honor. The person designated to argue this uh, segment of the case uh, had uh, an emergency at home and was unable to make it, and I apologize to the court. Um, but the time has not been wasted. I have been in conference with other members of the team. At this time, Your Honor, we'd like to indicate to the court that we will not be asking to admit the events of June the 17th at this time. However, I repeat at this time because we have not yet heard the end of the defense case. 
We have not yet heard Sir rebuttal, and I would like to reserve the option of asking to renew our request to admit that evidence, depending on what we see in the balance of the defense case in chief and Sir rebuttal. All right, Mr. Cochran, as to the withdrawal of the uh, June 17th witnesses. Yes, well, we, we certainly accept that withdrawal. We think it's appropriate, save you having to waste your time on that. And uh, we accept that, obviously, Your Honor, no problem. I'd like to raise a couple of issues if I might, Your Honor. All right, well, we're not finished with that yet. Okay, certainly. All right, the offer is accepted. However, the failure to appear in court in a timely manner and failure to advise the court sanction will be $250 to the district attorney's office. That's to be paid by the close of business today. I'm more annoyed. Yeah, I have to remind the court that Mr. Shapiro kept the court waiting for 20 minutes, so I have 20 after 9 when it was his witness on the stand and suffered no sanction. Thank sure. you. The sanction will be $1,000. How much? 1000 What the judge did today was outrageous. It was vindictive. It was petty. And it is uncalled for. There is no basis for the judge to go from $250 to $1,000. No warning. He's punishing Ms. Clark for standing up and pointing out the fact, and it's a fact, underline it, fact, that the defense has been repeatedly late. Has the judge even said, don't do it again, or there might be a fine? Absolutely not. Nothing ever happens to the defense. And it seems to be a double standard that's being employed by the court here. If the defense does anything wrong, so be it. The prosecution does something wrong, bam, hit. And not just hit lightly, embarrassing hits. That's uncalled for. I'm not going to take that anymore. I don't expect Marsha Clark, Chris Darden, or anyone else to have to accept that kind of judgment by this court. Mr. Harmon, you may call next witness. People recall Gary Sims. Mr. Sims, have you conducted additional testing that you're here to provide uh, the results on in this case? Yes. In your opinion, do your RFLP results corroborate your interpretation of item 31, the center console, where you concluded that the possible sources would be Mr. Simpson and Mr. Goldman. Yes. In what sense do they corroborate them? Of the RFLP patterns that are consistent with those two individuals, uh, Mr. Simpson and Mr. Goldman, tends to corroborate the results in item number 31, which is also a center console Jen. blood stain. The simple bottom line is this. A four-probe match shows blood on the Bronco console is consistent with blood from O.J. Simpson and Ron Goldman. Strong evidence for the state because there is no known relationship between Ron Goldman and O.J. Simpson that would explain the presence of Goldman's blood in Simpson's Bronco. All right, Mr. Harmon has completed his direct examination, and Mr. Sheck, you may commence your cross-examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Mr. Sims, from what you know about the way the chain of custody for the Bronco was handled between June 14th and August 26th, do you think it was handled appropriately in your forensic opinion? Well, I don't, I don't know the whole history of how that Bronco was maintained. I don't know the whole history of that. I've heard that there were some... Um, that cost of A rule. It's an expert opinion, counsel. Please continue. Oh, Lord. I've heard that, that the defense has raised some issues with regard to that. I don't know the truth of the matter on all these issues, though. Know. You'll see between this period of June 15th August 26th, did not observe special care rule to 
preserve the integrity of biological and trace evidence. And we think that the, the saga of the Bronco illustrates this concept of the evidence being contaminated, compromised, and corrupt. Mr. Sims, you don't know who was in the Bronco in the early morning hours of June 13th. The early morning hours of June 13th? No, I don't know. You don't know who went into the Bronco between June 14th and August 26th? I don't know. Thank you. We're all tired. It's enough monkeying around. We've got, we've got our witnesses ready to go. Ms. Clark, you may call your next witness. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Bill Bozia. Yeah. William J. Bodziak, B-O-D-Z-I-A-K. Sir, you've previously testified as a qualified expert in shoe print analysis, correct? Yes, ma'am. Were you able to form an opinion regarding the size of the shoes that caused the shoe prints at the Bundy location? Yes, I was. And what's that opinion? That size was an American size 12 with the European size 46 sole attached to it. You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give before this court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Agent Diedrich, you've previously testified in this case as an expert with regard to hair and fiber comparisons that you made in this case, correct? That's right. In your examination of the hairs collected from the evidence items in this case, sir, did you find any hairs that exhibited the same microscopic characteristics as those of Nicole Brown? I did. Did you find any hairs uh, that you found to exhibit the same microscopic characteristics as those of Ronald Goldman? I did. There were hairs that were recovered from uh, Mr. Goldman's shirt, and there were also hairs recovered from the uh, Rockingham glove. And did those hairs appear to be naturally shed or forcibly removed? Uh, they were cut and torn. cannot definitively uh, call these parallel line imprint patterns, with that exception, a shoe print. Is that correct? That's correct. However, are these parallel line imprint patterns consistent with coming from the Bruno Magli? No. Mr. Goldman's boot? No. Could they come from Mr. Goldman's jeans? No. As a shoe print examiner, sir, is it one of your duties to be able to distinguish between impressions that are from shoes versus impressions that are not from shoes? Yes, it is. This area that's circled represents this thumbprint size area of the envelope at the Refer top right corner. So you compared the impressions found on the envelope and on the paper to test impressions taken of Ron Goldman's jeans? That's right. And when you did so, sir, did you form an opinion? My opinion is that the imprint pattern on the back of the envelope and also on the piece of paper could have been caused by the genes. Now, is there something about the features that you just described of those uh, parallel lines that is significant to you in terms of your determination as to whether or not it's a shoe print? Yes, in my opinion, it's not a shoe print for a number of reasons. If the shoe was totally bloody or the surface of the bottom of the shoe was totally bloody, there would be prints extending out because a shoe print isn't that small. It's much bigger. So there would only be one scenario when you could have a shoe make an isolated, literally an island of an impression by itself. This is a trial. Trials should not be coming again. I feel a little bit disappointed about the whole process. The bottom line, I know you're going to ask me the question whether or not I'm going to go to L.A. rebuttal. One time experience is more than enough. Life 
have to go on besides O.J. Simpson case. Yeah, we also have other scope arguments. I want to get some witnesses in front of the jury now. Mr. Newfeld saw her do that yesterday. And Counsel, so let's not get in. I'm not going to require them to do so, and it's within my discretion. I know a Supreme statute, Court precedent that I can give to you. scheme that says you can't do it. You need to have some authority to ask me to completely ignore a statutory scheme, wouldn't you say? Counsel, I've heard the argument. I'm preparing to rule. Thank you. We're all tired. It's enough monkeying around. We've got we've got our witnesses ready to go. Counsel, all I'm doing is seeing what issues I need to resolve so you can conclude presenting your case. I have nothing further. All right, anything else from the people? At this point, Your Honor, the people will conditionally rest rebuttal subject to the matters the court is aware of. Do you know, sir, precisely how much blood was on the Bundy and Rockingham gloves? No, I do not. People having rested their rebuttal case. Uh, Mr. Cochran? Yes, we're ready to proceed, Your Honor, with the um, balance of our case and small case. So, uh... defense cannot seek appellate relief in the middle of the trial on issues dealing with the exclusion of evidence. Such issues are only reviewable on appeal after a conviction. For now, the jurors will not hear that the nefarious police detective who spit racial epithets at people and then lied about it under oath refused to testify for fear of incriminating himself. Poof! Mark Furman disappears. Ultimately, the jury never hears about that instruction and his failure to retake the stand. And defense attorney Gerald Ullman has written about this, about the legal decisions in the case, and the way he sums up the Furman fallout is perfect. He says, and I'm quoting here, it was one of the most bizarre episodes in a very bizarre trial. This time you're on the defense calls Professor Herbie McDonald. All right, Mr. McDonald. <clears throat> Recall. Did you have an opportunity to watch on television portions of the testimony of Mr. Rubin, uh, who testified about uh, Aris leather light gloves? Yes, I did. If you were to drench the gloves and have them dry naturally, that's where you would get the 10 to 15 percent shrinkage. Did you conduct an experiment? to determine whether or not smearing Aris Leather Light Extra Large Gloves with a considerable amount of blood would cause 15% shrinkage? Yes, I did. These gloves could have shrunk because they had been tested, they had been soaked in blood. The gloves that you received for the experiment were identical in terms of make and model and size to the gloves from Bundy and from Rockingham. That is my understanding. Now, would you please tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what you did as an experiment to determine uh, the extent of shrinkage, if any, when gloves are heavily smeared with blood? Yes, I, I took the gloves one at a time and put, for example, the right glove on my right hand and a rubber latex glove on my left hand. I had a laboratory technician draw a vacutainer of blood I then poured the blood over the leather glove, cupping the palm upward, as I'm indicating, so it would hold the blood as much as possible, and began smearing the blood with the rubber uh, tips of my fingers. This was over a very large funnel. The funnel emptied into a graduated cylinder, so I could determine the amount of blood that was recovered. I immediately took it off and put one in a bag, which I sealed up, a plastic Ziploc bag. This was then repeated, and then this glove was also allowed to dry without being placed in a bag. These were both done very quickly, so there was no clotting of the blood on the surface of the glove. What, if any, shrinkage did you observe as a result of your experiment on both the left glove and the right glove? Uh, I can detect no shrinkage or no linear or 
vertical or horizontal shrinkage at all or change and shift. Could you please explain to the jury what 1379A, B, and C are? The one on paper is before. LB stands for left glove before experiment. I then made a left glove before transparency because I felt by having left after in red was uh, perhaps not easy to hold up to a light. Could the smearing of the Bundy glove and the Rockingham glove with blood on the evening of June 12th, 1994 account for a 10 to 15 percent shrinkage in those gloves? I, I can't imagine it's at all possible, no. If I never existed, if they never found a bloody glove at Rockingham, if they never went to Rockingham and all they had was Bundy, there was ample evidence there to have a prosecution and a conviction of O.J. Simpson. Ms. Clark. Now, the crime scene gloves that you examined were clearly not new gloves. Isn't that right, sir? Oh, that's true. They were well worn. And the gloves that you tested, being brand new, were never rained on, correct? Not that I know of, no. They could they have been never... repackaged. I'm not sure it was the original package. I've had them in and out of plastic, uh, protecting plastic bags. So I don't honestly know if it was a brand new package I got them in when I received them, but they were wrapped up. Okay, and they appeared to be brand new to you, they, didn't they, they sir? They were definitely brand new. Okay, so they'd never been, as far as you could tell, they had never been rained on. No. Snowed on? No. Sleeted on? No. They, they appear to you to be pretty pristine. Would that be a fair statement, sir? Very much so, yes. Do you know, sir, precisely how much blood was on the Bundy and Rockingham gloves? No, I do not. Okay. So this was just kind of a random selection of an amount of blood to put on there? No, it was what I felt would be an adequate volume to smear all over a surface. And as it was, it only took two out of the nine milliliters so it was certainly more than adequate. With your experiment, sir, you cannot tell us why the crime scene gloves are 10% smaller than your brand new gloves. Isn't that correct? If they're the same size, they shrunk, yes. But other than that, no, I don't know what caused it. Thank you very much, sir. As the case of the People versus O.J. Simpson winds down, the prosecution continues to try to regain lost ground and recovered from squandered opportunities. Coming up, the defense calls two mafia hitmen, each in witness protection, to testify on behalf of O.J. Simpson. No kidding. Everybody was making, again, the language of Craig Fiato, a f***ing big deal out of stuff that was bull. That's next on O.J. 25. I'm Roger Kosek. <laughs>